contrary to what you might have heard, you can teach an old dog new tricks. Just look at Starbucks. For years, the coffee kingpin stock was stalled, pretty much doing nothing. Stock in the 50s. Then in 2017, longtime CEO Howard Schultz steps down. Kevin Johnson, a tech guy from Juniper Networks, take his place. A lot of people were a little confused about why a chain of coffee shops would bring in someone from Silicon Valley as CEO. Now, it took Johnson a little while to turn things around, but it's safe to say nobody's confused anymore. Thanks to better technology and better drinks, Starbucks finally solved its food food problem. They're able to move the lines along much faster now. They're growing like bad in China and seem to be doing just fine in spite of the trade war. Nitro, the red-hot cold brew, is crushing it here in the U.S. The latest quarter was spectacular. Big top and bottom line beat with 6% same-store sales growth. In response, the stock shot from 90 to 99 in a day. Although, since it's pulled back to 96, I think it's a bargain at these levels. Do not take it from me. Let's check in with Kevin Johnson, the president and CEO of Starbucks, who masterminded this incredible turnaround to get a better sense of where his company's headed. Mr. Johnson, welcome back to Man Money. Thank yeah. you, Kevin. Have a seat. Thanks Thank you. All right, tell us. Magnificent turnaround. How'd you do it? Well, a lot of this was focusing on the right things and then executing with discipline. Specifically, we focused on the experience in the stores, beverage innovation, cold brew, nitro cold brew, refreshers, and extending that experience in stores to a digital customer relationship. That was the key. All right, now you clearly believed in yourself in the turn because you told me in the 50s that was it. You're gonna take some of that seven billion and you are just gonna stand there and buy stock. People didn't believe you and you bought and bought. Well, you know, we did the Global Coffee Alliance with Nestle a little over a year ago. And as part of that Global Coffee Alliance, they, uh, they paid a $7.2 billion uh, for the, the licensing rights to sell Starbucks at CPG and food services. We took the $5 billion after tax uh, from that $7.2 mm -hmm. billion, and we did buy back stock. We've been aggressively buying back stock uh, since last year when it was, uh, you know, was at lows as, as, as low as $50, $50 a share. Well, it was a great move. And uh, you have said over and over again you're going to grow at scale. Mobile, order and pay, throughput, delivery, these were all part of your strategy. And I think they're all working. Well, as I said last quarter, we're firing on all cylinders. Right. You know, you look at uh, our business in the U.S., our business in China. You know, we posted a 7% comp uh, globally. Uh, you look at the Global Coffee Alliance, the work we're doing with Nestle. We've now expanded into 16 new markets. Uh, and so, you know, the company is on a path where we now are accelerating the pace of innovation mm -hmm. in ways that we believe are relevant to our customers, inspiring to our partners, and they're certainly meaningful to our business. This has actually, of course, happened in China, too. There are a lot of companies that are confused about their mission in China now. It's a lot of part because of Washington. You're not. Those numbers demonstrate an acceleration in China during this, the trade tension. Yeah, we had an acceleration in China. And, and two months ago, Jim, I was in Beijing to celebrate the 20th anniversary since Starbucks entered China. We now have 50,000 uh, Starbucks partners in China who proudly wear the green apron. And it was a, a real privilege for me to be with them and share that experience. So we have built Starbucks in China for China, and they execute on what we call China speed. Oh, and they're working. doing a great job. It's working. Now, I didn't know until my kids did it. The phenomena of nitro. You always told me that you got to get that day part in the afternoon, uh, moving cold brew from a hot coffee place. Well, Jim, it all started with cold brew, which uh, which is is a, is a form of coffee. It brews over for 24 hours in cold water, and as a result, it's a much more creamy, caramely uh, tasting beverage with a little pop of lemon. Then you add nitrogen to it, and it just makes it creamier and sweeter. And so the combination of our cold brew, nitro cold brew, our refreshers, has unlocked the afternoon day part. In fact, a little over half of our beverages now are cold beverages. Well, millennials that I speak to were saying, oh, geez, you know, I was going craft, whatever. I, I don't, millennials, what happened that this thing took over? Well, I think clearly we identified, you know, early in the cycle that this was a flavor profile and the shift to cold was going to happen. We amplified our R&D and our innovation around cold beverages. And as a result, uh, we began to see that that was resonating uh, with all customers and especially millennials. We then started to put nitro uh, in all of our stores. And by the end of the uh, next month and end of September, we're going to be in all company operated stores with nitro. And but you also have a new drink coming out when tomorrow? We have a new drink coming out tomorrow, and I think we've got one of our uh, great Starbucks baristas, Tatiana, who's who's here, has just made Tatiana. She's made Tatiana's made a, uh, a pumpkin cream well, cold brew. I well, this Tatiana, is new for you. me because I'm always one of the first people to do the pumpkin in the in thank you in, in when it comes to October. This will be true. You're moving it up a little. This is it now. Pumpkin cream cold brew right here. That is so good. All right, so we got wow. 
We got to talk about something that you also, and this is we got credit to Howard. We had a business roundtable last week. Suddenly discovered something that you've been doing <laughs> since you started, which is to recognize that there are more people than just shareholders. And look what it's done for you. Do you think the people just saw the success of some companies like you and realized they better get on the case? Well, I think one of the most special things about Starbucks is that we have a mission and a purpose that is grounded in humanity and a purpose that goes far beyond the pursuit of profit. And I give Howard Schultz and all the leaders that came before me all the credit in the world for this. They, they operated the company this way from day one. And that means we're going to invest and take care of our partners, whether it's health care, college achievement. Uh, you know, that veterans are probably the best there is. Well, we just exceeded the 25,000, uh, the goal of hiring 25,000 veterans or military spouses. We've exceeded that goal three years early, and we are now on a run rate of hiring 5,000 veterans a year. That is and so all of those things, you know, add up to, to what we're doing to really drive a purpose that goes beyond the pursuit of profit. We did know the lines were too long. Some of mine, mine is still too long in between 7.30 and 8, but that's okay. It's a small format. Uh, the notion of technology as being what was necessary in order to get to scale mm -hmm. played into your strong suit. So what did you learn at Juniper that helped you at Starbucks? Well, certainly 32 years in the tech industry and, you know, you know, 16 years at Microsoft and at Juniper, two things. Number one, modern day retailers have to create an experience in the store and then they have to extend it with a digital customer relationship. And at Starbucks, when I joined the board uh, over a decade ago, we started on that journey. And today, you look in the U.S., we have over 17 million active, uh, active loyalty members. They use the mobile app regularly. 42% of our tender is from loyalty members, on, you know, payment on that mobile device. So the importance of that customer connection. But then most recently, we've been using technology to help automate administrative tasks in our stores that free up our partners in the stores to focus on the customer. And, uh, you know, simple things like inventory management, some of the, some of the labor scheduling and the scheduling of their, their shifts uh, is all automated now. That's freeing up time. Partner engagement is up, and customer connection scores are at an all-time high. Now, talk to me about Brightloom, because you know I think it's important because of who's running it. And I think it's amazing for you to realize that this was the whiteboard that Howard told me years ago could happen. Well, you know, we've worked for a decade building this, dig what we call the digital flywheel, the ability to connect right. with customers, personalize offers to them. And we've done that in our company-operated stores, mainly in the U.S., Canada, Japan, and the U.K., but we have licensed partners around the world that run uh, different technology stacks, different point of sale systems, and we want them to have access to the digital flywheel. We actually want all food and beverage merchants in the industry to have access to it. So we licensed our digital flywheel software to Brightloom with Adam Brotman at the helm, and they are com creating a company that's gonna focus on uh, providing commercial cloud-based services to all food and beverage merchants so that they too can enjoy the benefits. Yeah, uh, uh, Having to be in the restaurateur business now, I, I, that's when I want to own stock in a beverage and public listing. Uh, you do have an uh, ingrained in China relationship, and you know, Alibaba, and it, everyone's so negative, and everyone just believes that there's never going to ever be a good resolution. Uh, it, it, you've seen it all. I, is, it, 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 is that really how it has to play? Well, first of all, I would say, you know, the same way we built this great global coffee alliance with Nestle, we have a very important strategic partnership with Alibaba, our China digital partnership. And, you know, over the years, I've gotten to know Daniel Zhang and, and his leadership team very well. They are great partners to Starbucks. Uh, and, you know, we're very optimistic about uh, the strategic value they bring and how we work together. You know, that said, you look at the geopolitical situation, I think everybody recognizes it's better for all nations and all merchants to be able to have, you know, a good global trade environment. And I believe we'll get there. Okay, good, good. I want that. And then the last thing, uh, you know, people keep talking about that we're going to be in a recession or something. Uh, you've got a huge footprint in the United States and you've got it all over the country. If people are uh, not willing, are you bumping into any resistance on price? Because that would indicate to me that there really is some sort of recession. Or can you, I'm not sure what this costs, but I bet you it's going to be incredibly popular. And that's a good sign that we're not going into recession. Well, Jim, right now, our customer connection scores are at an all-time high in the U.S. And that's okay. a function of two things. That's a function of how well our Starbucks partners are serving customers. But it's also a little bit of the attitude that consumers have as they're engaging with Starbucks. 
you know, that said, we have not seen signs of, uh, you know, in the U.S. Of, of anything related to a slowdown. But we do know these things go in cycles. But right now, we're firing in all cylinders, and consumer, consumers seem to be doing well. You probably know more about, maybe there's a guy at Walmart, maybe someone at Target, and then there's you, in terms of people who know and have the pulse of America. I'm going to congratulate you for an incredible incredible performance you've done for shareholders, but also for stakeholders, which I know are just important. And people should go out and drink this because it's darn good. Okay, I want to thank Kevin Johnson, president and CEO of Starbucks. Look at this run. And Kevin engineered, but he would tell you it's the people in the green apron that deserve the credit.